Well, let's um, come and look at Jonah and we're going to continue and we'll pray as we look. So would you join with me, Father? As we look to your words to us, would you speak to not only us, but help us to understand how you work in creation, how you work with people when they've rebelled against you, how you work your plans and your purposes to bless, and ultimately how you did that through Jesus. Help me to speak clearly, but help us to understand a bit more depth about what you've written in the Bible so that we would know you well, so that we would, you know, it would actually lift our trust and our faith in you. And no matter what we see going on, we'd be able to hold on to what you're doing in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I called this series Runaway, Sleeping, and, but I was going to call today Vomit. <laughs> but I thought, we won't write that on screen, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, and uh, we're going to read from three to, uh, a few of these verses. So would you join with me? We'll read together. I know we've looked at it, but I, I want to stop where we stop on purpose. So you ready? Follow me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And now I'm going to jump. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men grew greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Here we've got a fish, and this is what most people remember about Jonah. Uh, they remember the fish. I guess because if you were to stop, where go back a verse, and they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and a raging sea grew calm, and they, they were both terrified uh, and offered sacrifices and vows to God. That would be a normal ending. Just, I mean, you know, you've heard Jonah, and sadly, and I say this because it sometimes pollutes our story, but we know about the fish, but pretend you don't know. Wipe the fish out of your mind. Here's the story. God says to Jonah, go and preach to Nineveh. Preach to them, like pro prophesy to them to say, I'm going to judge, but I want you to come to me. Jonah says, no. Runs, and I was talking, if you were here, how he goes down, well, where he is, he goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the boat as a boat sets sails in the storm thing. He goes down into the, the sort of belly of the boat and he goes down into a deep sleep. It's like this descending down. Meanwhile, basically stress and calamity is hitting the sailors. They're fearing for their lives. They're throwing their livelihood, their cargo over, sea, over, over into the sea. And the ship threatens to break up. And it's written, as I said last week, almost like it contemplated. It thought to itself, shall I break or not? <laughs> okay, so there's this calamity. Here's a question, and it's a little bit like testimony. Have you ever trashed your life so bad that the consequences don't just affect you, 
but they affect people around you? Have you done things and realised, I'm not the only one paying for my stupidity or my sin? So are others. Have you ever sort of had that awareness, that realisation? And you notice for Jonah, the consequences from him running away from God don't just affect him. These sailors have lost their cargo, which some would say is between three and six months worth of their pay. So it's cost the sailors their, their, their livelihood, as it were. The, th the boat is threatening to break apart and they fear for their lives because of Jonah's actions. Now look at, let's sort of break away, what were Jonah's actions? He was called as a prophet to actually preach, and we read that bit at the beginning, God's heart. Yes, God would judge, but now because it is a prophet, the prophetic books fall into a pattern, and I tried to capture this. Sorry, let me go to the slide here. Sorry, they're small, but they didn't translate as well as I wanted. So the prophets here come to Israel usually, and they say, Israel, you have sinned before God. Now, when they ask Jonah, who are you? And he says, I'm a Hebrew. What he's saying is, I'm one of God's people. And God's people had a calling. And there's a sense, sense to which Jonah is trashing his calling. So his job, as it were, is to share God's heart, both judgment and forgiveness. So the prophets will call Israel out. They'll say, you have broken your covenant with God. You have done sinful things in the eyes of the Lord. And you notice at the beginning, God says about Nineveh that their evil, their wickedness has reached into his nostrils, is how it says. So the, the filth of Nineveh has actually gone up and God's gone, oh, I can't stand this. So he calls Jonah to prophesy against them, which is not just condemn. See, they would call. What would happen to God's people, you see in the prophets, is that judgment would fall on them and they'd get taken away into exile, either by Babylon, which was a big, strong nation who would come against Israel, captivate them, capture them and, and drag them away. If you remember by the rivers of Babylon where I sat down and there we wept and they said, sing to us a God song. And they said, how can we when we're, when we're in exile? But you know how they were led away, God's people? They literally put rings in their nose, not chains like we do with slaves or prisoners around their, their waist. They put rings in their nose, noses and chained them and dragged them like an ox. That's the commentary. So they would be dragged into exile, e.g. like Babylon. But... The prophet's job was to say, you have sinned, you are being judged, but God is going to actually rescue you, restore you. Have a look at this story in Hosea, who's one of the prophets, and it's chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. He's God, or the prophet, prophesying against Israel. Israel has broken my covenant, has rebelled against my instruction, and they cry out to me, our God, we acknowledge you, but... They have rejected what is good. So an enemy will pursue him. They set kings up without my consent. They chose princes without my approval. With silver and gold, they made idols from themselves to their own destruction. This is the judgment. And if you jump into Hosea 8 and then 8 to 10, look at that picture, sin, exile, restoration. And so Israel is what? Swallowed up. Now she is among the nations like something no one wants, for they have sold themselves among the nations. I will now gather them. They will begin to waste away under the oppression of the mighty king. Do you notice that word swallowed up there? Interesting that when Hosea is prophesying, he uses this image of Israel being swallowed. But let me just go forward. Jeremiah in 51 same sort of pattern, Nebuchadnezzar, who is a king of Babylon. Look what it says here in the commentary. After they've been captured, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has devoured us, swallowed us. He has thrown us into confusion. He has made us an empty jar. Like the sea monster, he has swallowed us and filled his stomach with our precious things 
And then he what? Has spewed or vomited us out. This picture of Jonah being thrown overboard and then being swallowed by a fish is not a new picture to the prophets. We think it's this anomaly that no one's ever said before. But Jeremiah, Hosea used the same imagery of when God's people sinned, they were engulfed or swallowed by their enemies. So let me come back. Have you ever, have I ever, have we ever, even as God's people, so trashed our calling that we're pretty much swallowed up and the consequences of our sin affects others? You could make a commentary about where not only Australia but our world is. And there's an interesting thing that uh, has been noted is when God's people slash the church, when they actually come and bring good news to a people group, that people group flourishes. When that good news, when that sort of call of God is rejected, they crumble. And you can look historically and see it over and over and over again. As a covenant people, we have a call. And I just want to jump back to our call and, and mirror, it, uh, sorry, mirror it against Jonah when they say, who are you? See, here's the question. Tell us who's responsible for this trouble. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? In other words, they're saying, who are you? Jonah, the prophet, who doesn't want to do what God has asked him to do. And interesting, we'll come back to why again in a little bit. So when he asks who I am, and he, remember he's trash, everybody's in trouble. His answer, interesting, he does not lose the identity or the sense of who he is. Notice he says, I'm a Hebrew and I worship Yahweh, the Lord, capital letters, means Yahweh. I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made this sea that we're being tossed about on and also the dry land. So here is Jonah, even though he's running away, and this is what I want to say, in the midst of not only Jonah trashing his call, but when we trash our call and we may run from God, guess what? He pursues us. It's a, you know, Psalm 139. Where can I flee from your presence, O Lord? If I was go to the far ends of the sea or the earth, and notice Jonah's going from Joppa down here right across to get away from to Tarshish, which is as far away as he could, could get to by boat, because after that is just the oceans. So if I were to flee to the other side of the earth, you're right there. So here's my question. Can you run from God's presence or can you run from God's calling on you? And the answer is no. You can't. Think about it in the context. Even when Jonah is doing the wrong thing and fleeing, Look at what happens for those around him. He's, well, God's ministry still is being outworked. The sailors, even though they feel like they're losing everything and Jonah reluctantly is present, his very presence, and even when they throw him overboard, brings about salvation for them, the sailors. In other words, as they're going through, they're terrified and God's demonstrating who he is, not who Jonah is, but the God of Jonah. I'm a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh. As they throw him overboard, the sea calms. And the result is that they actually sacrifice to God, which is an, an acknowledgement of God being worth something to them, having saved them from this storm. But they also make vows to him, which is, we will follow you, Yahweh. So even though Jonah is fleeing from his calling, it doesn't stop God's presence working through him. I think I mentioned this. If I didn't, it was in my mind last week and the week before when my mum used to say this to me. We can do this the easy way or the hard way, but nonetheless, it's going to happen. So you can come and do it now 
or I will drag you kicking and screaming. I had a young woman and I preached back at Burwood. And it was in the night and there was, you know, a whole lot of really younger, as in uh, uni, uni age students. And uh, this young woman came up afterwards and she said, I hated that message. And I went, oh, what did you hate? I might have said it wrong. What was it? <laughs> she said, oh, no, 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 no. It's like God's telling me this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to follow. I'm not doing that. There's no way on this earth I'm going to do what God's asking me to do. And I was trying to think, in my message, what was I? What was God asking her to do? And she said, if God is asking me, this is literal, she said, if God is asking me to go west, I'm going east. That's what she said. I went, wow. And you know what jumped in my mind? My mum. <laughs> if God's chasing you, you won't get away from him. And she did go to the furthest ends of the earth away from him. And I can't tell you I know the end of the story because last I talked to her, her life was trashed and it was heartbreaking. But here's our confidence. If you run away, will God just let you and wait for you to come home? Where can I flee from your presence? Well, let me take it to the, nth, to the next step. Can you flee from your calling? God has actually placed on us to go back to these pictures here because it's the same story. The prophets, we actually are meant to call out sin. Now, we do that very carefully and graciously. One John would say that if you are going to confront someone with sin, pray first and be very careful lest you be drawn into it. Okay? So it's not a matter of, I want to tell you something, you're wrong. Like the prophets, we may need to be poetic. See, I would suggest to you, Jonah is written at a story to make God's people go, oh, what? thrown into the sea because let me jump back to there if that's where the story ended and you didn't know about the fish you'd be going oh Joni see tried to run from God he's got it wasn't that what you'd think there's no way that you'd be thinking fish except for Sunday school and so when this fish and let me try and get back to it now the Lord verse 17 provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah so this fish, as it were, this swallowing, because he's in the depth, and we're going to look at the prayer next week. I'm stalling it on purpose. But this fish that swallowed him, and then his ensuing prayer, which is like, I'm sinking into the depth, and the seaweed has wrapped around my legs and wrapped around my neck. I was perishing. The fish is God's provision in the midst of his sin. God provided a huge fish to swallow him. And here is my little thought. If you're on the boat, just imagine, here's Jonah, I'm running from God. Who's seen Titanic? Okay, the boat sinks, sorry. <laughs> but I love the scene in the beginning when you've got Celine Dion singing, near, far, wherever you, and he's out the front, or with the girl, whoever she is, and, you know, just he's a wind in the hair and Jonah's going across to Tarshish, you know, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, and then the storm hits. He's not free. And as the storm hits and shakes them up, and, and you've got the story of, and I was trying to think, was he on the bow or the stern? Which is the pointy and which is the blunt? And I went, actually, there's two scenes. At the pointy end, you know, they're all free. Remember the story at the blunt end of the boat? They're about, the, the woman there, she's about to throw herself and kill herself. And he's trying to save her, as it were. Even in that little Titanic, now that's an ad addition or a made-up bit, we're sure, in the Titanic that, that uh, Leo, Leo DiCaprio, whatever his name is, was not there trying to save some poor girl at the back. But God provides the salvation in the way of a fish that would swallow him up. I want to jump, I'm going to quickly go to Matthew. And this is when the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I looked at this last week, they're actually saying to Jesus, they're trying to trap him. And they say, Jesus, who do you think you are? Do you think you are a prophet? This is the question. Do you think you are a prophet? Then show us a sign. Okay, because prophets, often their, their word, their, their voice was accompanied by a sign. 
And hence why, let me just say this really clearly, God's word is so precious and sacred, we dare not say God said unless he said. Because when prophets spoke, it came true. So we have to be very careful that what we say is true. Because if it doesn't come true, then actually it's a false prophecy. Okay? So Jesus is saying, here's the sign that I am a prophet. And, oh, actually, he makes a commentary on them. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given, or one will be given, you could say, and that is the sign of Jonah. What happened to Jonah? He was swallowed up by the fish that God had provided and stay, lay there for three days. What would happen to Jesus? And I commented last week that the cross was like the fish. I was wrong, sorry. I got a bit excited. But almost, as I contemplated, no, the grave is the fish that Jesus was taken into the depth of the earth, into the grave, Sheol, for three days. And look at the parallel and look at the gospel in that God swallows us up, but notice what is he swallowing? And if you go to Jesus, and even if you know the, one of the creeds, it would say, I believe in the virgin birth, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe that he was crucified and laid in the grave and on the third day rose again. So he was swallowed up. And do you understand that Sheol, or the grave in the Old Testament, is death and curse? Go right back. We are not meant to die unless we sin. Jonah sinned and was swallowed up. Swallowed in his sin. And that's what the prophets would say all through. Jesus did not sin, but was swallowed up. In other words, he descended into Sheol, the grave, death, which is the curse or the consequence for sin. However, if you go to that overarching picture that God is slow to anger, not wishing or wanting calamity to befall his children, God, and if I go to those pictures, rescues in the same way that Jonah is vomited out of the grave, out of Sheol, out of the depths, to go below the surface, because we're meant to live on the, on the solid ground. That's where we were created for. So to be taken below that, be it in the belly of a fish or the dirt, that is a sign of being cursed, ultimately, or death. So Jonah is vomited out. So they take Jesus into the grave. Three days, he lays there in death. If you equate that with what's going on in all of the prophets, in judgment. So God has to be just. He can't say to Jonah, yeah, run, this is a fun game, run for all you want. You know when your little kids are running? And I remember I knew why they created nappies. Well, at least a secondary reason because they're great for grabbing at the back of the nappy and picking up this wiggly little child. And, and you put it down, and it's a bit of a fun game because they keep running and you pick up and you bring them back, but God's not playing. He has to take sin, be it ancient sin or modern sin or my sin, seriously. And like Jonah, the consequences of his sin hit the sailors, and if God hadn't have intervened, would have hit Nineveh, who he was about to save... The consequences of my sin have to be dealt with. And here you see Jesus entering into death. I listened to, and it's heartbreaking, but I listened to a minister at the funeral of someone who took their own life. And what I didn't realise, because I knew him quite well, is that his own brother, when he was younger, took his own life. And his struggle is, where is God in this? Where was God? Where is God? And his answer is, right there that God enters into. He doesn't watch, but he enters into. 
And if you look at the pictures, and particularly of not only forgiveness but being covered, he pushes us out of the way and he takes the fullness of death. And so the Bible would say we'll only taste death. We will not be consumed or swallowed by death. So you'll know that little passage that says, where, oh, where is death is your sting. So we'll be taste, but we will not be swallowed or consumed because Jesus takes the full brunt of the consequences of our sin. And then, I love this picture, if I use Jonah. Maybe I'm just wondering whether I should say this. <laughs> but then he was vomited out of the grave. But have the picture of the fish, you know, it spewed him and up from the grave. You know, at Easter we sing that song? <laughs> up from the grave he arose. It's almost violent. And look at John when he says the ground cracked open and the stone was rolled away and he walks out victorious out of the grave. And this is the image of Jonah, of Jesus, of the gospel, of God rescuing us. So let me go back from the first question I asked. Have you ever trashed your calling or your life so badly that it affected other people, that your, that my, that our sin affects other people? And what do we do about that? Jonah running from his calling. Does that mean he lost his calling? No. It means that God actually redeems him in and for his calling. And God will cover our consequences. So let me go when I made a comment about us and our testimony. All you really want to know about me is that I sinned. What you want to know and the world wants to know is how did we get out of the consequences of that sin? And that will be God, even Jesus. See the cross that's been thrown overboard into the depths of the sea and swallowed by the fish sort of being held there in death, suspended as it were, and it's meant to twist your brain because they didn't see this story coming except when I went through Hosea and Hosea, Hosea, sorry. <laughs> and when they go through and they go like, you swallowed us in captivity. And the Jews had gone, I know this story. They know this language. I know this metaphor. I know this, this poetry. And he's saying, you have sinned, Israel. That's what a prophet does. And you will be judged. However, one will come who will take, who will cover and be swallowed fully. And then we. So here, and I, I think I've still got it here. I tried to, uh, I didn't use it last week. The fish is death, buried, baptised into the death of Jesus. So we actually, and the baptism is the picture, and here's one for you, if you like fish and water. Baptism is the picture of Jonah being swallowed. Because definitely that's what the Bible says, we are baptised into his death. Now ours is only a picture, and we come out the other side. We are baptised into the death with Jesus, but we are resurrected or spat out or vomited out the other side resurrected with Jesus. Can you believe that the gospel so graphic in the Old Testament? Thousands of years, literally, well, hundreds of years before they came to be, that God actually had already worked out his plan and his picture. So, have you trashed? Yes, I have. Have I dropped my calling? Yes, I have. Have you? Does God just leave us there? No, he'll actually deal with it in and through Jesus. That's the sign. But he'll take the fullness, and I guess we don't understand. And if you've looked around at the consequences as I have to other people, all I can do is say, Lord, please do not hold them accountable for my sin. Heal them from my sin. But it's important you realise that what we do or don't do has consequences. It doesn't mean God won't work. But as my mum said, I'd rather go with God. I want to be part of what he's doing. We'll get to Nineveh. 
what he was doing in saving a nation. I want to be part of that. So you go with or you go against. Go against, he'll pick you up, kicking, screaming, and bring you and put you back. That's God. Too big to run away from. So don't bother trying. But the beauty is, ultimately, he covers us. So have you trashed? Yes, I have. Is there grace? Is there forgiveness? Is God wanting to judge us? No. But he has to, and he does through Jesus. And so we come out of that water washed and cleansed and restored into not only his child, but our calling. That's what qualifies us for you know, the prophetic ministry that we have in this world. Well, I want to invite you to pray with me to not only ask God for forgiveness, because I think you can never say sorry too many times, but to reaffirm our calling and help us focus on the gospel of what God does in the midst of that. Would you join with me? Father, as I think of the consequences of my actions and my thoughts upon other people, as we think about what we have done, that has grieved not only your heart, but has hurt other people. All we can say is, Father, we are truly, deeply sorry for the grief we have caused. And I ask, Lord, that you would heal and restore those we have grieved or hurt. But I also ask, Lord, that as you cleanse us, as you literally have taken out the full judgment that we deserved on Jesus, and we're buried with him, we also have been resurrected with him. We come to life in you, Father God. Life into our calling. Life into the ministry of your grace and your mercy and your love for others, particularly as expressed through Jesus. So Lord, forgive us, cleanse us, and raise us up, not just for our own good, Lord, that others might be blessed through the ministry you've entrusted to us. Father, we are your children. We are saved by your grace. We do stand in the life of Jesus. And we do carry your Holy Spirit who calls us and works in and through us to minister the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So Lord, help us to stand, I pray. And we thank you for all you've done to cover us in Jesus' name. Amen. This song just acknowledges what Jesus has done for us. So please stand with us and sing. Commands all the hosts of heaven. Who else could make every knee bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. Who other beauty demands such praises? Splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing. Oh